do you do when your 401k just is not that good? Brian, I am so excited because we get to answer questions like that. Hey, I have this financial thing going on in my life. How do I approach it? How do I attack it? How do I figure out how to navigate that? That's one of the things that we love doing here at The Money Guy Show. And we love being able to speak into the things that truly matter to you guys. So right now we have the team out in the wings collecting your question. Make sure you get them in the chat. And with that, I'm going to throw it over to you, Producer Reby. Oh, yeah. We've got a question to kick us off from Jake. He says, I have a for horrible 401k. My employer doesn't give any match and the fees are close to 1.5%. Mm. I've tried to talk to HR about switching providers, but they won't budge. Should I get the tax deduction and then roll the money immediately into an IRA or just skip it and contribute to a taxable brokerage for now? What do you think? What do you do if your 401k so is not what you I want to make sure I clarify. High fees. I heard mm -hmm. the high fees. What was the other parts? Of no, the, match. No, no match. match. No That's match. That's the big one. One and a half percent annual fee. Because okay. we get this question all the time. People yeah. will say, hey, I don't have a match. Should I just skip the 401k? I know you guys say, Brian, we hold the financial order of operations. No, yeah. I know you guys say, hey, in step two, get that free employer match. But if I don't have that, does that mean I should just forego the 401k? Mm -hmm. Well, not necessarily, but because we believe that 401ks are still amazing investment vehicles strictly because of the tax savings available to you because they allow you to choose. Do I want to save taxes now by making pre-tax contributions, or do I want to save taxes in the future by being able to make Roth contributions? Well, that's a huge benefit to 401ks, not even, oh, I thought you were about to say, not even taking into account the match or the fees or anything like that. So we still think 401ks are a fantastic tool for you to be able to use. Now, if you are in this situation where you have a bad one, how do you figure out how you navigate that? How do you figure out how you make lemons out of lemonade inside of a bad 401k? Yeah, but we, we, you, 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 you said the magical word, kind of like Candyman, 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 or whatever. You, you said foo. Okay. And, but you didn't give the context of if there's no employer match, this now, instead of it being a step two consideration, <laughs> it's more of a step six consideration. Sure. Yep. Because what I don't want anybody listening who's got high interest credit card debt and they're paying 20 something percent on their credit card. And then here we still like 401ks. We like 401ks that give you 50 cents on the dollar. That's a 50% guaranteed rate of return. I like 401ks that give you dollar for dollar matches up to 6% of your pay. That's like a 100% guaranteed rate of return. That's why you've got to get in there and get that guaranteed 50 and 100% rate of return over your 20% high interest credit card debt. If it's not good in those terms, now it's you you take it into consideration on step six, max out your retirement options. But even then, it's one of those things where you have to really look into dive into how bad are the fees, how bad are the investments? Because what I thought before I knew what the question was going to be, I thought he was gonna say something like his employer gives him a match. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, you have to love the one you're with, even though because that fifty percent that fifty sure. cents on the dollar, that dollar for dollar, that fifty or hundred percent rate of return is so good. But when I hear a plan that has high fees, mm -hmm. no match, this is one, Bo, that somebody needs to go start advocating to their employer, hey, what do we do to kind of jumpstart the, the, this 401k? Do you realize how much money that you know you could encourage your employees to save? Do you realize how much money you, the government encourages you to save for yourself mm -hmm. if you structure this 401k right try to make this a win-win for both you the employees as well as for the employer because somebody is missing a huge opportunity jake and and you if you structure this right it could really change the the, the potential and opportunity for everybody at your workplace well and it sounds like jake has been doing that didn't he say the last part of his question i've been trying to tell hr i've been communicating with him i'm getting nothing back getting nothing back yeah nothing so he's back. really left with the decision like like what this isn't do? good now what do i do and so yeah. i would argue even with one and a half percent fees which is not great if you are like a higher income individual and maybe sure. between your federal and your state taxes you're paying like 30 percent taxes i would argue that being able to save 30% on your tax, putting a dollar in and saving 30 cents will pay for many, 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 many years of one and a half percent fee. So it is still advantageous in that realm. I think the other thing that you can do if HR is continuing to just hit you with a roadblock, 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 is you kind of look at it and you figure out how do I love the one that I'm with? How do I figure out, are there any half decent good investment options? Maybe there's a very, maybe higher expense than I want it to be, but there's 
an S&P 500 or a low cost index option. And inside of this account, I know I'm gonna be very concentrated there. And then with my other investment accounts, my other options, there I might diversify so I can build a robust portfolio. But it does kind of stink to be stuck in a plan where they are unwilling to change. Now, he did ask one other thing, I think. He said, hey, should I just put money in, take the deduction, and immediately roll it over to an IRA rollover? If that's an option inside of your plan, maybe. Maybe you could, you know, twice a year, once a year, put money to the 401k and roll it in. But two things to think but about. That, that'd be an odd oddity. I mean, most most plans don't allow in-service distributions like that. That's right. Like your that. plan would have to make that available. And you'd have to make sure that doing so didn't prohibit any other types of planning you might do. Because if you have a 401k and you roll it into an IRA, and maybe you're like a backdoor Roth contributor... By having that new IRA, now you can't do that type of strategy. So you just want to make sure you understand the ins and outs of why that may or may not make sense, even if it was something that was available to you. Yeah, and, and Bo and I are kind of saying the same thing also in the fact that we're not against, especially step six of the financial order of operations, but since step six is after step five, this is after, Jake, you've hopefully are already loading up that Roth IRA, um, is assuming your income allows for it. Um, and then also, if you have a high deductible health plan, that you're also checking into that health savings account. Because we want to make sure we're taking advantage of all the tax-free growth opportunities before we pay attention to the high income tax deduction opportunity, especially if you're with a bad 401k plan. Yep. Awesome. Well, Jake, thank you for the question. Hope that helps. Okay, this next one. Lots of people are noticing age drags. Yeah, good. What? Nothing. Keep going. That part was for Brian. Uh, you know, no, I, I planted some I Easter eggs. I know what you said. I know what you said. I, I you know, know what you said. I just was focused on this next question. Oh, okay, so sorry. Um, okay, this next question has caused a lot of conversation, and so we've got to ask it. Okay, oh. it's trending. It's spicy. Mary asks, "What is the money guy take on the Robinhood three percent IRA mm. match and their new three percent cashback credit card? It seems hard to pass up as a mutant." but also too good to be true. So what do you guys think? All right, Brian, let me, uh, let me lay out kind of what's going on here for folks who have maybe been living under a rock, and then I want to kind of get your thoughts on yeah. how they should approach it. Um, so Robinhood, uh, this in, uh, investment company, this trading platform, has come out with um, this promotion right now that if you roll money into an IRA, if you roll over a 401k or roll over an IRA or, or put money into their accounts right now, they'll give you a 3% match up until a certain date. We'll April, th April, up 30th. Until April 30th, right? They'll give you a 3% match. So if you move $100 into an IRA, they will give you $3. That's the right math, right? Uh, so you scale that up, $10,000, $100,000, 1000000 dollars They're saying there are no caps on this. But after April 30th, it does change. And they're going to give you a 3% uh, match on contributions you make to the account. And that's going to continue on. Now, in the future, when you want to do this, it's going to drop down to 1%. So right now in this April window, there is, it sounds like it's free money. It sounds like if I move my money over, if I put my money in here, I'm going to get 3%. Now, there are some catches and some caveats of how long the money has to be there. Yeah, Robin Hood Gold. Robin, yep. Yeah, you have to be a member, and it's what, either $5 a month or $50 a year in order to be able to unlock this benefit, but not incredibly cumbersome to get to. And then there's also this 3% credit card, where essentially they're offering a credit card to, is this to only gold members as well, where uh, you can get 3% back on all purchases, 3% cash back. And so, on the surface, you can join the wait list to get three percent back. It's yeah, not. It's not guaranteed. You can't just actually sign get the card yet. And so, on the surface, this sounds pretty awesome. It sounds like, oh man, this is free money. And the guys love free money. They talk about it all the time. Is this something that I should take advantage of, or is this something that maybe I should have some spidey sense going off on? What yeah. say you? Um, th there's a few things that that hit me. Look, first, let's let's go with the positive win here. I love it when competition creates something that that changes the marketplace or starts a dialogue because you know that probably the, consumer. the other retail providers of investments you know even even the big boys the the, the vanguards the schwabs and the fidelities they have to be paying attention to what robin hood is doing because from a pr standpoint and discussion standpoint this is everywhere mm -hmm. it's all over my twitter feed um the first thoughts i had is number one will this last um 
I, I we have told cautionary tales because banks and financial institutions for years, decades, have been using bait and switch tactics where they'll you know like think about high yield savings accounts. Um, I've told you, be careful about chasing the highest yield. If you go to bankrate.com and look at the highest yield, and you're like, man, this one is paying like a half a percent greater than everybody mm -hmm. else. I've never heard of them, but they're FDIC insured, and you go do it, and then you, you might be surprised that six months in the future, their rate is half of even what the consistent brands mm -hmm. are. So uh, this could potentially be a bait-and-switch marketing ploy to harvest assets and then go back to, to something that, that's more in line with everybody else. But we don't know yet. Not enough time has passed sure. to know if this will stick around. The other thing um, that I thought about, and I did a deep dive on this, is that I, I don't know, because this had nothing to do with everything that's just come out here in 2024. I just know Robin Hood in the past, when we had the whole GameStop trading yep. issues, and then even before the GameStop issues and the lawsuits with the stock options and there's been some unfortunate you know stress and, and other things for some users who didn't understand because they were in products that were way too complicated yep. for for where they were in their investment knowledge is that i have known for a long time because institutional investors talk and i, I know some traders and others who work for big organizations and they and they talk about it like it's not a secret and and and, it, and there was even an article that came out in cnbc in 2020 that Robinhood makes its money by the trades that its people mm -hmm. place. And, and here's what the crazy thing that, that you guys probably don't realize is that Robinhood gets to charge a 35% premium to the market makers and those who pay them for their, their, their transactions um, because of the reputation that a lot of the investors that are buying on Robinhood are brand new. They're mm -hmm. freshly minted investors um, the the word dumb money is used way too often, but it does mean that the people are probably a little green. And here's the numbers back in 2020. We haven't updated this. Probably could be a great exercise. This is all from SEC filings. Um, like if you think about it, Robinhood on a stock trade gets paid like 17 cents for every hundred shares. Mm -hmm. Schwab was 11 cents. That's like 35 mm -hmm. percent. Options. There's a reason they're pushing options is because that's like high 50 cents, like 58 cents for every 100 shares um, versus Schwab. It was like low 30s. It was like a 37, 38 percent premium they were charging. This all leads me to say, and, and I'll give you the analogy of Hansel and Gretel. You know, you, you, we all know this, this childhood story where you had this house made of candy and, and baked goods and other things to attract children. And then once they got in, the witch essentially was trying to put the, the kids into the oven to eat them. Mm -hmm. So they lured them in to turn them into the product. And that's a kind of what Robin Hood, to a degree, has done in the past to make money, is that you are the product. Um, it's kind of back to, a, I'll use the rounders saying, if you sit down at a table and you don't know who the fish is at the poker table, you're the fish. So, and, and, and with all that said... I'm not against Robin Hood because this is not the only financial institution that does this where you, the person, are the product and your trades and getting access to you is the product. Credit card companies do the exact same thing. They give you all these incentives. They give you all these rewards and cash back and everything else and trading vouchers to get you in because there's this whole jeopardizing thing of paying 20 to 25, 30% interest rates mm -hmm. on it. They also are not noble causes to, that they're offering you these rewards and trading. So you, as long as you go in, what, your eyes have to be wide open. I mean, don't do this while you're half asleep because you, you'll find, get yourself in a bad situation. But if you go into it with your eyes wide open, um, there's definitely some opportunities here. But I'm sitting back. Um, and waiting because I, I think it's just too early. I want to know is is Robinhood maturing, and this is their way to get more market share and try to capture the excitement of because um, they're new, doing nothing any different than what your employer does with your matching contributions. That's mm -hmm. what makes us so powerful. But um, I need to see a little more history. I need to see a little more that the that the business model has evolved because I want to know are are their people the products. Um, in, in a way that's 35% more than others. That's that's not a positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
or is this just a, a moment in time and you just need to be aware of the ins and outs? I, I, we went around and kind of like casually asked a lot of our folks here, hey, are you doing the Robin Hood thing? Like it's free money, are you doing it? And a lot of our folks said, no, I'm not doing, I'm not doing it. And we said, why? And this was the general answer that we had. And we even asked some of like our, 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 our younger, new associates, and they said, I already have a good plan in place. I don't, I don't really want to like jack up the plan. I've already got my Roth on autopilot. I'm already doing this. I'm already... And I think that's great because we know that personal finance is 80% behavioral. So if you're already set up in such a way where you've got your accounts open and you're saving and you're focusing on the things you should be focusing on and you're not majoring in the minors, you're not getting lost in the weeds, I think that's great. I don't think that the Robin Hood thing has to be something that you jump on or else you're going to miss out on opportunity because I just don't th think the opportunity is all that attractive unless you are someone who's thinking, oh, hey, I'm just trying to look, I'm trying to figure out where do I start? How do I sign up? I know I'm going to buy low cost ETF indices. I'm not going to be trading. Then yeah, maybe it's a great solution. But for folks who already have a plan in place, I don't know that this is going to like be some magical thing that you ought to uh, upset your entire Apple card on just to try to go grab 3%. Yeah, another thing they don't offer mutual funds. This is one of those things. If this, if when we turn this into a highlight, if this does well, I have even more thoughts on the behavioral stuff as well as how you use this and and some of the risks that also go into gamifying trading or getting you into more complicated products before maybe you even have the experience or knowledge to do it. Um, so if this clip does well, or if you if you guys think this is something you'd like to do a deeper dive on, let us know in the comments. And um, great question. Fantastic. Well, there you have it. The money guy take on Robin Hood as of today. Love it. All right. Next question is from Connor. He says, good morning, longtime listener, first time caller. I just opened a Roth IRA through Fidelity Nice. and plan to maximize contributions this year. Can you walk through the pros and cons of dollar cost averaging? Well, um, here's the... Uh, Here's the con of dollar cost averaging. Uh, if the market goes up this year, you will have left some money on the table. Here's the pro of dollar cost averaging. If the market goes down this year, you bought in at lower and lower and lower levels. So what we like about dollar cost averaging is that it prevents you from being 100% right or 100% wrong. It removes a lot of the emotion. I have so many, by the way, for those of you that don't know, let's do a quick vocabulary. Dollar cost averaging is just simply the process of buying in a certain amount on a certain time period. So a lot of people will do $100 a month into the Roth IRA. That would be dollar cost averaging into the Roth IRA. And it sounds like that's what Connor wants to do. I have had so many young people in my life that I get them juiced on these Roth IRAs. I'm like, oh, you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. And I convince them, maybe they just got their tax refund. Maybe they just got some bonus money or whatever. I'm like, hey, go do your Roth. And what they would do, and this happened a lot back in like 2007, 2008, 2009. I'd get them to max out their Roth. They'd put back then it was what four or five thousand dollars, and a year later, a year later they'd be like, "Bo, what in the world did you tell me to do? I put in five thousand dollars, and all you did was make me turn five thousand into forty five hundred. You're an idiot." And I'm okay. like, "Ah, oh, man, okay, maybe." So now what I tell people to do is I no longer tell them to max out their Roths because I tell them to dollar cost average. Hey, if you're gonna put six thousand in a Roth or seven thousand this year, divide that by twelve and start doing that on a monthly basis because. We know that what, eight out of every 10 years, market is up just about, right? You're gonna have two downturns. Well, odds are, if the market's mostly going up and you can be dollar cost averaging, you're going to see some growth in your account, which will hopefully light the fire to allow you to keep doing it. What I worry about is someone who just happens to put their money in at the wrong time and the market falls for the rest of the year, falls over the next 12 months, and they lose their fervor for investing. That's why I like dollar cost averaging. It's less about uh, mathematics and less about like the ad, uh, the optimal investment strategy. And I think it's more about the behavioral. Yeah, you, you just kind of, the, the part I was gonna say to make this really simplified, mathematically, it's always better to lump sum. However, in this instance, I think behavior is greater than the math. And, and what I mean by that is, is that I want you, creating automated wealth is inevitable wealth because I, I think the hardest part for people is just to stay disciplined to be consistent and just keep buying no matter what's going on in this crazy world that we live in and that's what dollar cost averaging will do for you so because you just 
once you set up your monthly amount or quarterly amount, whatever period that you're using, it's just you don't have to use your brain power anymore. Mm -hmm. It's all set up. You won't even miss the money after you get used to it, and it kind of gets processed through. And as you get pay raises, I'd encourage you to increase your savings and investments. But it's just done, whereas... Uh, I know if you if you have to actually take the action of starting the investment, funding the investment, and putting it in there, there's a lot of behavioral traps that you could fall into that you, you do it once and then you don't do it every year. And that, that's the part I don't like. Now, look, there's a let me put the asterisk disclaimer. So I think we're all agreeing behavior trumps the, the, the math of this. So mm-hmm. do dollar cost averaging with the asterisk that if you start making enough money that you can't you might be phasing out on the income threshold for making Roth contributions then I'd prefer you to be doing lump sum unfortunately taxes do cause you to complicate your life because it's kind of hard to unwind these contributions if you put the money in and then you make too much money you have to bring it back out it it just adds a level of complexity that you'll be like man I just wish I would have um, waited and looked at my income numbers and then funded it. Because remember, you always have from January to April 15th to actually fund that Roth for the previous year. um, It's better to wait and see the numbers to get it measured twice, cut once on it. Um, It's another one of those examples that the more successful you get, the more complicated and things that come into to your life. But in the beginning, the behavior is what's important. So do the dollar cost averaging so you can not waste any more time and create that inevitable wealth through automation. Love it. Awesome. Connor, thanks for being here and we appreciate your question. Yeah, I saw a, I saw a comment come through like, man, I can't believe Brian is able to write on that pad. I can't believe that his hand is still working. Seems like some folks have been oh, yeah. like dialed into our, what you been working on these oh, past man. few days? Every, <laughs> like, I, we had a meeting yesterday where it was, it was the, all the people in the hiring team and I told, I just apologized to him. I said, look, I'm listening to everything you say, but during this entire meeting, I will be signing um, these cards because I have, I think so I have what are like, those for though, Brian? What are huh? those cards for, Brian? So everybody who took advantage was of our February promotion of pre-ordering Millionaire Mission. Or, or or millionaire <laughs> mission it's everywhere yeah we, we we have tried to um or millionaire mission you know it's it, it literally is everywhere right now um I, i've got i've so we sold thousands of copies and i am super thankful so you don't you don't hear me complaining i'm very excited and i even found myself as i'm doing you know doing the signatures it's it, it's kind of an act of love and i'm actually doing it you know that's another oh, yeah. thing i think a lot of people um, cause there's automated signature things. There's even services where I could stamps. submit it, it stamps it. I could have done. I'm literally, and that's why if you see a smudge or something on there, it's me. It's that's a I'm Brian Preston smudge. Uh-huh. There's, if you look at this little pinky right now, there's blue on it right now. So, I mean, it is a hundred percent me. My fingerprints are probably on every one of these things cause I'm holding it as I sign it. So it doesn't slide around. So it's um you're you're getting a moment in time that I'm I'm signing these because these book yeah, plates fine. are important. I know that you know I appreciate every one of you that bought the book, um and but but don't and also realize that was a February promotion. We're still doing promotions sure. every month. There are things you could get, so you haven't missed out on the opportunity to get additional benefits. If you go to to moneyguy.com/slash millionaire mission, I'd love for you to sign sign up for getting the pre order of the book. Um, because he, here's the thing, we don't have a big corporation behind us, um, but, and I'm trying to change the world in my own little way, um, and this book is going to do it. If we can get enough of you guys to buy the book, um, I think we'll make a statement, and, mm-hmm. I, and I think that and that gets me excited because it also this book is going to change some people's lives. This is I'm hoping that just like when I got um, the Millionaire Next Door, or the Wealthy Barber, when I was in the mid '90s that this book just lights your mind on fire of excitement. And also for the, the person that's maybe already worth or well on their way to becoming worth seven figures, you're going to find some nerdiness in mm-hmm. here that I think the way I process the world that you're going to find affirming and also motivate you to keep the journey going as well. But I, I'm super excited. I, I, I mean, you guys know Megan and I are working on um, some other things that we'll be announcing next week uh, with Rebe working on the logistics on that. And, um, it's some cool stuff. It's really cool. And I hope you guys will go on this journey with us. If you're out there like, man, what are they, what are they talking about? What is, 
If you have not, first of all, if you're not subscribed on YouTube right now, make sure you subscribe so that way you can stay in touch. And then if you're not following us on socials, all of these pictures, all this stuff, it's out on Instagram and on X and on Facebook. So make sure with you can make sure you connect with us on our socials so you can see all the behind the scenes stuff we're doing other than just 10 day Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Central. Yeah, so just know when we say, hey, if you order in February, Brian's going to sign these things, and it's a limited time thing. We were serious. He's signing every single one, and we had to put it limited time because, obviously, you can't – you're signing a lot. Already, I'm sorry, and but, I'm, but look, I'm thrilled. Somebody like, said, I'm why so are you thankful. not outsourcing that or automating well, that's that? that's not legit. No, because, but I, no. I think that there is something to signing stuff yourself. Dude, yeah. It's just like I wrote this book. I'm signing this stuff. I mean, yes, they're a way to cut the corner off, but that's not that's not the way we do things around here. We 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 try to do it, and I want you to feel like that I appreciated every one of you who took a, a little bit of your money to to buy this book and go on this with me it means a, a ton to me. It really does. Yeah, and we do have some fun stuff around the book coming up, and some more stuff to just you know let you know about. So definitely subscribe and stay tuned. All right, are you ready for the next question? Yes, yes ma'am. Hockey Haylod has a question. It says, we have a third on the way due in October. Ooh, congrats. congrats. That's exciting. Would you recommend dropping the 25% savings rate to get cash for a minivan in October or save the rate and take out a smallish loan? Yay, messy middle. So lay out the variables one All more right, time. So but. they got a third coming up yep. in October. So they're probably going to need a minivan. They're going to they need a, a larger car. Not uncommon uh, when you go from man to man is on coverage. That's what yeah. happens. Uh, <laughs> their question is: In order to pay for the minivan, should we drop our savings rate from twenty five percent down, right? Okay. Or should we leave our savings rate at twenty five percent and go out and borrow a small sum of money to be able to buy with the minivan? So it sounds like, should we save between now and then cash flow to be able to pay cash? Or should we keep saving, keep putting the money in the market, keep investing? And when it's time for us to buy the minivan, we're going to take out a small loan uh, following 23.8, of course, yeah. uh, to buy it. What's the most advantageous strategy? Yeah. I mean, look, this is one of those things, and this is why I love the financial order of operations, is that life happens I mean, mm -hmm. you, and we talk about this because hockey's in the messy middle i mean when you got three kids i've watched bo you're in the same life that bo's oh, yeah. in right now and you're making these decisions but the minivan's got to happen now um because i mean it, you need it uh, i don't know that i want you going to no saving an investment during that period it sounds like you said drop it down i don't know that we're going to zero but right. it sounds like drop it down a little bit I do, but I just want to remind people what the whole purpose of 23.8 mm -hmm. is. 23.8 is the car buying rule that we have is because there are moments in my life, I'd be a hypocrite if I told you I paid cash for all of my cars in that first 10 to 15 years once I was on my wealth building journey because I didn't. I had to go finance. Like my first car out of college, I had to go finance a used mm -hmm. Mazda 626 with the oscillating vents in it and everything um and it was like ten thousand three hundred dollars i put down like a two thousand bucks and then i had to finance the rest because that's what i could do at that moment in time i think hockey i'm okay with you a minivan definitely qualifies for 23.8 that's not a luxury vehicle mm -hmm. now here's the word of caution there's a big difference between like because I, I think about some of my relatives and friends i've seen going and buying like a used caravan or some sure. of these other cars because you can get a minivans are so considered so uncool by by the market mm -hmm. that they they haven't gone up like an suv or now in the hundreds of it's thousands crazy. of dollars Brand potentially SUV, yeah. um but but or even trucks have gone that way but but minivans they humbly have not had these huge run-ups in prices but i'd still encourage you you know if you're having trouble and can't pay cash for this thing um, and, and without even taking away from your saving investments, nothing wrong with buying a used one, putting 20% down, financing no longer than three years, and making sure those payments don't exceed 8% of your gross income. And of course, your investments have to exceed your monthly car mm -hmm. payment. Those things, they're set up there to keep you in a, in a good place. Um, just don't go load up. This is not the time to go flex, if you can consider flexing with a minivan. Um, 
and I buy mean, something could. that is. I'm about to say there's some, <laughs> there's some, some pretty nice fancy minivans. Ones. And, and look, you had this whole thing where y- y'all got a minivan. I mean, yeah, no way, well, hey, so I'll let you. Handsome sp- family's a minivan. Let's do, family. let's do some experience share uh, here on, on what you and your your spouse did. Well, it's necessary. I love it. Uh, my wife, you know, she's a big fan of the show. She's probably listening right now. Uh, she doesn't love it as much, right? She liked the big. She liked the big SUV better. But it's amazing. I, I think when it comes when you think about this messy middle decisions, in my opinion. Uh, there's a lot of like opportunity opportunity cost constructs you have to work through. I mean, one real intra- easy one, right? If you just want to think about like purely mathematics, okay, if I'm going to take a small loan, what are interest rates on that loan going to be? If I go out and buy an auto loan, am I going to be paying like seven, eight, nine percent to borrow yeah. money on this, or am I going to be paying like four, five, six percent? Because that would come into the my thought process on whether I'm going to decrease savings and build up cash and pay cash or go with a little bit of loan. Here's the other thing that I think you ought to think about uh, as I'm following the financial order of operations. Brian, hold the thing up for me. As I'm following, and by the way, if you want your copy, go to moneyguy.com slash resources. As I'm following through it, I want to think about the opportunity cost of the dollars that I'm sacrificing. Meaning, if I have to drop down my 25%, but what that means is, okay, I'm saving a little, a little bit less to my taxable account. Or maybe I'm not putting quite as much in my 401k for a small season. That's different than if I have to drop down my 25% and now I'm starting to sacrifice Roth and HSA dollars. Yeah. Because those are dollars that are going to be hard to make up time on. After tax account, you can make up the time on that. Even in your 401k with savings limits at $23,000 annually, you can make up the time on that. But if you start saying, hey, I'm not going to do the Roth, ooh, that one starts to get me a little, a little bit more nervous. So I think you have to... You have to do the math on those two things and marry that. And realistically, what it'll probably be is some combination of both. How can I make sure that I'm putting my dollars to work, I'm following the food, I'm making it work for me, but I'm also not getting into bad debt that I don't absolutely have to get into. Here's what I love, 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 love that you're doing. Third is due in October. Do you know you know what month it is right now? Yeah. It's April. Yeah. You are thinking about this way ahead of time. That's what a financial mutant does. We know when we have large financial decisions coming, we get out in front of them and start the planning now. And when it comes time to buy the car and do the thing, it's not going to catch you off guard. It's much better than you saying, hey, you know what? We drive a Honda Accord. Uh, surely a family of five is going to fit in there easily. Not going to be the same as a minivan, but you're figuring that out now, which uh, hockey, I think, is awesome and a great a great thing. I, I do want to clarify one quick thing, though, because without a doubt, number step number three, we, we have the credit card on high interest mm-hmm. debt. That's a no-brainer because credit cards are now 20, 20 plus percent. Um, I have heard in the last month, two people have told me about auto loans that are, I've heard 15% on oh, no. one, I've heard 11% on another. So when I hear numbers... Like that, without a doubt, if you're looking at the financial order of operations, auto loans can, de- in this day and time where interest rates are, can definitely fall into high interest debt. If you need some guidelines, we've done a lot of stuff. It's more like sway- the way you look at student loans. Mm-hmm. If you're in your 20s, I consider anything above and beyond like in the six-ish mm-hmm. range in your 20s as high. So when Bo said if you get a 7% car loan, that does probably you need to go back to the financial order of operations and consider that 7% as a high interest. So look and figure out what you're going to do with your next dollar. If you're in your 30s, the number goes down a little bit. Maybe now it's in the 5-ish range on what's high interest, 40s, 4%. You can see because it's based upon what you think those dollars actually had the opportunity of becoming. And it, that's what will protect you because when Bo's talking about the Roth and so forth, you can imagine somebody who's in their 20s, Roth IRA money with the wealth multiplier and that compounding growth is just so powerful. It's okay to probably look at the arbitrage there, but but for some, if you're paying, if the interest rates on these things are uh, greater than 10%, mm-hmm. it's like, ooh, yeah, pay, save up cash and pay that off because it's just not worth um, dealing with that if, it, if your interest rates are that high. Can I, I'm just going to throw one more free piece out there. This has nothing to do with personal finance, just experience here. You know, we had the big SUV. We did that for a while. Uh, but, man, every time my kids got in it and there were, like, French fries and chicken nuggets and that's the – it just oh, it drove me crazy. When I see that kind of stuff in the minivan – and, I'm Hockey, I'm sure your kids are perfect. Don't drop stuff. Totally cool. When I see the minivan kind of driving, ah, that's what it's built for. That's what it was made for, <laughs> right? Like – I just, me personally, as a consumer, I have less anxiety seeing a, a dirty minivan here versus like the super nice SUV. And by the way, we have tons of friends. We have a bunch of friends who all have the big SUVs. 
Oh, I just, that's a lot of money for little kids. I can tell you as a person who doesn't have little kids anymore, but I try to park next to minivans because I know that nobody's opening the car doors. No. The kids aren't, because that's who, that's who dings your cars. It's, that's you know, true. bless their heart. It's the kids that pile out of the car and beat the heck out of the car next to them. Minivans, you don't have to worry about that because those, those doors, you know, just do that nice slide back. And then, I mean, that's, that's pretty Ryan's sweet. A real fan. You did not know that you were getting uh, parking hacks here on the Money Guy Show. Yeah, park next to minivans. I love it. Unless the parents are jerks, you're probably not getting dinged. <laughs> Good to know. Well, hockey, uh, congrats on the third baby, and I hope that really helps. Good luck on the car search. All right, Justin has a question next. He says, my wife and I moved recently into our new home. We are renting out our old one to a military family for the next four years, but then plan to sell. We currently have about 200 k in equity in that home. So when we sell, should we roll over that equity into our new home or plan to invest that money? How should they think about that? It, but I just can't, because this is where the CPA and me just, and I'll let you I know. clean I it up. I saw it too. I saw um, it too. Justin, I just want to make sure, because look, you do have, there, there is a fork in the road moment that happens when you, you have your primary residence and you decide to rent it out. Um, especially after we just came through that post-2020 period where housing went up 40 to 60%, depending upon where you live. There's a lot of appreciation that happened in primary residences uh, and in housing in general, um, is that the fork in the road moment is, is you like, do I sell it and take, and here's the deal the government offers you. If you've been, if you've lived in this house two of the last five years for a married couple, there is a $500,000 tax-free gain That's waiting huge. for you. Yeah, it, huge. It, it, up to $500,000 of gains are completely tax-free. Um, now, notice I said two out of the last five years. So there's potential you could actually rent this house out for the next two to three years and still be right within that window because you will have lived in it for two of the last five years. Um, or you decide, you know what, I'm just gonna be, I mean, this is gonna be the start of my rental empire and I'm just gonna rent it, rent it out, and then um, I'm gonna forego that $500,000 of tax-free gain exclusion that the government has set up for me. By the way, it's 250,000 for single individuals, um, if you're curious. So to hear you say that you're gonna sell this thing in four years, I'm like, whoo. Oh, it just are you, are you like, sure you're you don't year, hear three? You're a you year sure you outside of that, that five hundred thousand dollar potential gain exclusion. Um, just be. I want to make sure, Justin, you're aware mm -hmm. of that part of the tax code because you're like a. You, you hear the 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 tagline "day late, dollar short." You're going to be a, a year late on taking advantage of this five hundred thousand dollar. <laughs> Opportunity, so just just be aware of that. I'll let you answer the rest of it, but I I, I couldn't help my yeah, CPA self couldn't help that's you. That's huge. Uh, so then the question becomes: All right, well, when, when we sell it, whenever we sell it, we have two hundred thousand dollars of equity. What do we do with it? Well, we're good financial advisors, so our answer is going to be: It depends, right? It depends on <laughs> it depends how old you are and where you are in your wealth building journey. It, it really comes down to like opportunity cost. That two hundred thousand dollars. Where will it be best utilized based on where I am in my financial journey? Perhaps I'm someone who maybe I didn't save in my 20s and 30s quite the way that I should have, and I know I'm a little bit behind, and I've done the Know Your Number course, and I know what I need to get to, and I know where I'm at, but man, there's a big shortfall, and I don't know if I'm able to save there. This might be a great opportunity for you to take that $200,000 and put it to work for you, especially if the house you moved into is at like a low mortgage rate. Maybe it's at a really attractive mortgage rate. Or let's flip the script. Maybe you bought the house and the interest rate's not incredibly attractive right now. It's something like 7%, but you've been a really diligent saver. And when you look at your portfolio, it's pretty robust. You've been saving and doing the stuff you're supposed to be doing, following the financial order of operations. And maybe you're getting a little bit older. Maybe you were around that 45-ish year age mark. And you say, man, one of my goals is I really want to be debt-free as I get closer to retirement, as I enter into retirement. And boy, wouldn't it be nice to take that $200,000 of equity that I already built on the home. When I sell that home, I'm going to roll that into this house and I'm going to be that much closer to being debt-free. You have to do the analysis based on what is the interest rate I'm paying on the debt and what is the rate of return that I could receive based on where I am in my financial journey if I were to invest these dollars. And you're going to have to make a decision on that. But that decision will be different for different people, even in the same circumstance. It really depends on what your goals are, what you've been doing thus far, and what you want the long-term picture to look like. Now, I'm going to throw two, two caveats on there. 
let's say that interest rates are at like 7% right now, uh, or that's with a rate on your mortgage. Just because they're at 7% does not mean that they're going to be at 7% forever. So I do think they're likely at some point will be an opportunity to refinance. Now, you might not go back down to 2.5%, but you might go down to like 5%. So that's something that you want to be aware of. If you do decide that it makes the most sense to dump $200,000 on the current mortgage, one of the things I might think through is, okay, even if I do that, it's not going to it's not going to change my, I, I, I don't want to do that and allow my payment. Like I don't want to do a refinance or drop my payment. I want to make sure that doing that allows me not to stretch the debt out over a longer amount of time. And actually I stay on the same exact payment schedule so that I get debt free on the same timeline. Make sure you use it as, uh, uh, not as a crutch to limit your wealth building, but as an accelerator to accelerate your future wealth building. I always get, because it is true, a good financial planner, a lot of times when people ask us questions, we'll say it depends. And it's such a cop out. You're like, oh, I wanted specifics. Look, we've got the backdrop for you. This is why we give it completely away for free. Moneyguy.com slash resources. It depends on where you are in the financial order of operations. And that's why Bo was, because I was sitting there thinking, everything Bo is saying ties right into this. Because if your interest rate that, that that's offered you know, on, on the mortgage is going to be considered higher interest rate or you know that's why he said the whole refinance part because maybe mortgage gets an asterisk mm-hmm. next to it but it's also going to let you say because if you have two houses now you have your primary that then now you've got a rental so you got these two homes maybe you may you didn't do everything you were supposed to because you were focused on becoming a, an investor in real estate and you never got those roth contributions you weren't getting up to 20 25 in savings and investments this is the time when you get that two hundred thousand dollars to triage yourself and be honest about where you are in the financial order of operations, because that's going to tell you what to do with all those mm-hmm. army of dollars to be the most efficient and effective way with every dollar that you manage. Fantastic. Justin, thank you for that question, and we hope that helps. Seth's question is up next. It says, we hope to buy a home. Even following the methods that we talk about on the show, like 20% down or about 25% of our gross income, it still feels like we're paying way too much. Yeah. How can we have peace that we won't be house poor? Mm, yeah. And I think this echoes a lot of people's feelings right now. So I, you know, let's, well, let's help help this help them think through this. Let's first acknowledge that it's hard and you're not alone. Yeah. Uh, real estate, it, I mean, we, we, you can look at all the affordability indicators and it is, maybe it's not an all time low on the affordability, but relatively it is still, it's hard to buy a home and it's really, really hard for first time home buyers right now. So that you are not unique in feeling this way. Uh, but your question was, how can I have peace? Well, you already noted that one of the things you've done is you've listened to the content we're releasing this. By the way, if, you, if you're thinking about buying a house, we have an entire home buying checklist that you can go check out. We have a whole home buying hub with calculators you can play with. Go to moneyguide.com slash resources and check all of those things out that will walk you through, okay, if I am knowing that my timeline is right, meaning I know I'm going to be in this house for at least five to seven years. It's going to be a long-term decision. And I know that I'm putting down an appropriate down payment. It doesn't have to be 20%, but maybe I'm only putting down 3 to 5% because this is my first time home. And I know that the, my housing is going to be less than 25% of my gross income. The question you ask is, how can I have peace even though I still feel like I'm paying a high price or overpaying a large premium? The way that you have peace is knowing that you're following the benchmarks that are going to keep you from being in the situation where your life goes into the ditch. If you were to flip that and all of a sudden now your housing is 45% of your gross income uh, or, you know, you're you're uncertain and you might have to move within two years, that's when you can get yourself in trouble. But you can have peace knowing that, okay, if we can afford this and we're following the metrics that the guys say we should follow – Okay, I've done what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to, I say hold uh, hold my nose. You're not really going to hold your nose because buying a home is a wonderful thing. But it always feel wonderful, especially not in this housing market. Doing those things are how you set yourself up to have peace with such a large and, frankly, scary financial decision. Um, I want to give you kind of the, the nuts and bolts of what immediately popped in my mind and then maybe even share an experience share. 
Um, the first thing, and Bo kind of talked about this, I think time is your friend on, so the longer you can uh, know that you will live in this house, the easier it, it, it kind of mellows out the extremes of what's ha- what we just came through. Because with houses going up 40 to 60% because of that inflationary period, um, yeah, I can see the shock and awe that's probably going through you mentally right now that you because you know it's 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 recent enough that you remember what you could have probably bought some of these houses or when you look at the purchase history on the house you're the houses you're considering to buy and you see what people bought these houses for in 2015 or 2016 you want to throw up Mm -hmm. so i completely get that so the way you combat that the the longer your timeline if you know you're going to be in this house for 10 years it helps on a lot of that to, to mellow it out the second part is is that finan- non financial stuff matters too. Mm-hmm. So if you've got like a growing family and you got k- school age kids, um, and maybe it's the school system or it's it's something, or you want to make sure you get your kids into this community, um, or you want to be you know near your church or some other thing in the community that gets you excited and will give you those benefits that are outside the money part of it. That's going to also help you feel better about this moment in time and making such a big transaction. Um, here's the, the the experience share I have is that, that when I, every house I'd bought, I'd bought two previous primary residents for myself in Georgia. They, the first one was like a hundred and I know these numbers. I'm old, so 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 give me a little grace. I'm not Warren Buffett buying houses for sixty thousand dollars because that's the story you always hear. But I am old enough that I, my first house was like a hundred and ninety thousand dollars. My second house was right around four hundred thousand um, dollars. And then, but then when I moved to Williamson County up here, I, I was I had a little shock and awe because remember I moved up here. Um, I had a daughter who had some special needs, the special learning needs that she needed to address. And I had a, my oldest daughter who needed a good public school system and those things. It was hard to get all of the above. And we started doing a little research and this place kind of checked all the boxes specifically with that school. But when I, when I saw the sticker shock of what houses cost in Williamson County, kind of blew my mind. I was like, is, are you sure this thing's not out in California? I mean, because it felt like it. It's like Brentwood, Tennessee, it could, it probably the, the housing prices are very similar to Brentwood, California mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. Um, and I remember right after we bought our house up here, after closing, I, for, for a week to two weeks, I really did have not buyer's remorse, but it was just that I had what this, have I done? this gut <laughs> feeling because I knew I was on the line for a close to seven-figure loan now yeah. for that moment in time. And that, that haunted me. For, for a long period of time. Now, I have since created a plan. You guys know, I, I think, just to give you guys an update, I think I'm less than $50,000. Now, I've now told myself I'm going to have it all paid off by the book tour. Okay. Um, or the, the, the book things that are coming out. But I'm, I'm so sorry, Levy. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> but anyway, I, I will have it paid off in an upcoming date. But I'm just telling you, time heals all wounds. <laughs> Your income will go up, assuming you're doing well things. I screw everything no, up, it's but it's, um, it, it's fine. I, I, I keep you ought to see how I am with Christmas well, tell gifts. Me this, when, it, gifts. When, it comes to, when it comes to a home, I'm going to say this. For a use asset, oh, man, I'm going to say this, but, Brian, if this is dumb, just tell me, Bo, don't say that. It's okay to, it's okay to overpay. I mean, meaning it's not okay to overpay for home, but if you don't get the absolute number one best deal and you move out seven to ten years and you made all this money because you've done that before right like you 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 That's, bought a house like in one of your homes you didn't actually make money on the home right like it wasn't something where like yeah, it blew no, up in value no I, that, look I, I left Georgia just before housing prices went to the roof so I didn't I didn't make a ton of money but that's the, you are hitting on the non-financial stuff matters, mm-hmm. and that's that's the thing. I had a big life event, and that's what I meant. Non-financial stuff matters that caused us to go take on more debt. But time has made that better. Mm-hmm. Now it seems like a joke. I mean, because you see what houses are trading for now, yep. and you're like, well, what was I so worried about? Yep. But it is one of those things. Time is going to make it better. Um, but know that it's okay. Misery loves come. I mean, it's okay to get comfort in knowing that others have also had this buyer's remorse is a pretty standardized thing when you're making big financial transactions. So you just have to know the coping skills Mm -hmm. of knowing that this will get better over time as long as you've made the right decisions that you'll be in the area long enough and that you're getting enough other benefits, value benefits. Because remember, cost is what you pay, value is what you receive. So are all those value elements of community, good place for your kids and all that stuff, 
man, that, that stuff can be pretty priceless in what it's worth to you and your family. Love it. Great. Thanks for the question, Seth. Hope that helps. I'm so sorry. <laughs> What's I'm not the even mad. I'm the not chat's even mad. loving it though. Nothing that else to see. Lot. Nothing to see That's here. What, but Nothing sometimes else to say. I don't mind playing the the goofball because I am goofy. And then other times I'm like, God. <laughs> <laughs> so there are there's not playing, but there's like okay goofball, and then there's like uh oh goofball. And like no, this is literally Brian's a goofball. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's I love amazing. it. Uh, All right, we do have another question. Ready? Does this one get? Do we do post on this one or no? A little bit. All right, maybe we'll put like a chicken squawking over that or something, you know? We'll be like a sound effect or something. I don't know. Nate's got it. Nate's a professional. He's got it. He's got it. All right. Um, John's question is up next. It says, a Roth conversion plan. I don't have one. Should I wait until I retire in order to lower my tax rate or do it now? I'm currently 61 years old and plan on retiring at 67. All right, I, I don't I don't exactly know the question you're you're asking, John. So I'm just gonna kind of start talking, and I think. Well, I think I I think I understand. Let me just set it up, and then you put all the meat on it. All right. It, it you can imagine when you're 61 years of age, probably a lot of his peer group mm -hmm. are starting to retire. Sure. And he's probably also started watching a lot of financial content. Mm -hmm. And what is the first thing? Because we've even we do it all the time too. Is that we talk about for retirees? One of the big benefit value adds I think as financial advisors we offer is we come up with Roth, Roth conversion sure. strategies. And he's like, I what hear about this thing. Well, what, what is, is a, this yeah. thing? I, I think that's what. But that's that's the buzzword. He's heard probably uh, he might be watching content or he's hearing other peers in his in his group of influence. They're talking about it, and he's like, you know. Do I need to be doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, and so that's why, you know, I'll, I'll say what a Roth conversion is, and then I'll let you give the, the decision matrix of what you, how you bring it all together. A Roth conversion is where, look, it's not uncommon, especially for someone who's 61, because there was a long period of time before Roth assets and other things where 401ks traditionally, you get a tax deduction when you fund it, and then, but when you pull it out in the future, it's going to be taxed at ordinary income taxes. And, and also, think about this. The government actually has a mandated retirement. Required minimum distributions depend upon how old you are. For most people, it's going to be 75 years of age. Mm -hmm. But it's they force you to start pulling that money out. And since it's taxed at ordinary income tax rates, those are the highest tax rates that you can pay on money. You can quickly see why... Um, you have all this money from all your employer match as well as all your deductible contributions. You've got to figure out, is there a proactive way that you can pull this money out in maybe a more tax effective way so that you just don't wait and procrastinate and then you pay the highest mm -hmm. rates? That's exactly right. And so at 61, if you're still working, the problem is, John, you still have earned income. So if you were in, if in your working years, you were in a high income environment, if you were to start a Roth conversion strategy now, as it's traditionally defined, you start pulling pre-tax assets and 401k assets and converting to Roth, you, there's a really good chance you're going to be converting at a higher tax rate than you will be in when you retire. So one of the things we often counsel retirees to do is wait until your tax rate drops. And then when your tax rate drops, then we can start playing the tax rate game. We can figure out, okay, what bracket do we want to maximize? Okay, when are you going to start drawing Social Security? How, do we, how much of your Social Security do you want to be taxed? How do we keep an eye on the IRMA threshold so you don't get a Medicare surcharge? There's a lot of things that have to go into that thought process, but it usually happens after someone retires when their income falls. Now, maybe what you're saying is, hey, I'm 61, I'm still working, I just don't have any Roth assets yet. Maybe what you're actually talking about is, should I think about beginning to build Roth assets? Well, if you're someone who's in a high income bracket and you've not been doing it previously, but now you're able to do it, backdoor Roth conversions could very much likely make sense for you if your accounts are structured well. Because even if you're going to work from 61 to 65 and you're just doing backdoors for you and if you're married, your spouse, and you do that for the next four years, that can still be a large sum of money that can accumulate and continue to grow tax-free forever until you start doing these other conversions. You can see that at 61, there's a lot of stuff to begin thinking through as you begin to approach retirement. Because frankly, a lot of interesting stuff happens in your 60s. And then a lot of interesting stuff, frankly, a lot of interesting stuff happens every decade. But especially as you're moving into a 
very unique transition from being in the workforce to being out of the workforce, there are a lot of things to think about. There are a lot of boxes to check. There are a lot of strategies you want to make sure you keep an eye on. This may, in fact, be the time when you say, hey, I... I can do all the research, I can listen to all the YouTube channels, I can read all the books, but man, I really wish I had a co-pilot. I wish I had someone who could walk alongside me and not just give me like the general advice, not just explain what the concept is, but can bring it down and say, hey, John, this is what makes sense for you. This is a strategy that would be optimized for what you are hoping to accomplish. And if you find yourself in that position, I would encourage you, think about hiring a professional uh, and if you're going to hire a professional, we have a great resource on the website, moneyguide.com slash resources. Uh, it's questions to ask a financial advisor to know, is this someone who's going to actually be able to help me navigate the financial future that I want to actually navigate? So ask them these questions. And if you don't know where to start, we would love for you to fulfill the abundance cycle. Go out, go to moneyguide.com or aboundwealth.com, check out the work with us. This is the exact type of work that we do here at the firm to help people figure out, hey, I'm approaching retirement. Is a Roth conversion strategy right for me? It's a great question for a professional to answer. What I love about what you just shared, I think about there's an influencer out there who's a perma hater of advisors because he wants you to buy the, his, his thing. He'd rather you buy his stuff. But he showed his age a little bit and, and, and also the fact that he doesn't really know what we do because he said one of the problem with financial advisors is, is that they charge higher fees because people have more money yeah, later on life, when, yeah. when for older clients. And I was like, tell me you don't know what financial advisors do without telling <laughs> me you don't know what financial advisors do. Because I always tell you, the older you get, the more complicated a lot of this stuff. I, I tell you all the time, take all of our free stuff. Mm -hmm. Please go to moneyguy.com slash resources. Accelerate your journey, especially if you're young and beginning of the process. But I don't, you don't have to. Eventually, complexity will just find you. Yep. And, and that's what we see it. I mean, we had a call last week for a client that just turned 65, looking at all the Medicare issues, mm -hmm. all the supplemental coverages, and trying to navigate that. And we, we we'd had that phone call, and you could just see... And they're like, holy cow, I had no idea all these different elements on even choosing which Medicare premium or, or coverage to take on this. And I'm like, yeah, this is this is what we do. And I, I think that's the the big thing for, for, for John to recognize is that there will be more of these things coming. You only get you've only had one retirement, the one that you're living. There's somebody out there, like an advisor who's done hundreds of these things and can help you optimize your path because it happens every year all that irma analysis all the social security taxability all the looking at tax rates and looking at the distributions that you're getting from your portfolio that stuff happens every year this is not like you do it once and then you're like okay i'm good and i'm done no every year this is going to be a process that needs to occur so there's a lot of heavy lifting and it's good that if you can get somebody to help you through that process so it protects you from what you don't know yep all right john Thank you for the question. Um, I hope that helps, and we're glad you're here. Thanks for being on, uh, on the show today. Okay, Tyler H.'s question is up next. It says, at what point is term life insurance necessary versus optional? Should you get more as you age? My wife and I are in our 20s with no dependents, and we save 25% of our income. So it seems unnecessary, but I think this is a good question of, like, when should you be thinking about this? Because it's something that we talk about on the show. Let me let me give some overview, because yeah, yeah, no, I know you just, this, this is you in some ways. Oh, because, yeah. And you've had always had a Lots of life insurance, yep. but you've even made more. Got a decisions. lot more now. <laughs> so, Tyler, <laughs> this up. is the and look, we sometimes I think people think that like we're fee only financial advisors. We don't sell life insurance. So a lot of people say, well, these guys just don't like life insurance because they just don't sell a lot. No, just the opposite. Actually, we we recommend a lot of life insurance to to people who who will come and listen. And we even own I own millions upon millions of dollars of life insurance myself. Um, it is all term life insurance. Um, and here's what I would tell you on should you, when do you know when you should have life insurance is, is if your premature death would cause a lot of havoc and stress and put somebody in a heck of a pickle mm -hmm. if you passed away early. Now, you, you said, Tyler, y'all don't have kids. 20s, no dependents. No, 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 no dependents. So you, but you do have a spouse. And, and so you, if you're both successful and you're doing well, you're not really adding stress. However, you go buy that first house. Now, all of a sudden, if you pass away, because maybe y'all need both of your incomes to afford a, this house because housing's gone mm -hmm. crazy, 
you can see how maybe now having a life insurance policy that to at least cover um, the the mortgage on the house and maybe even a little bit of money to to give you the time to recover to mourn and because maybe you're not going to be the most productive version of yourself while you're working that would make sense but then it's a whole nother equation once you start adding kids and i look at bo now mm-hmm. because bo you've had you, you know i've got three children got a now gaggle of them, yep. yeah you got you got a whole brood like you said you're no longer doing man-to-man no. coverage anymore we've moved to zone <laughs> so it's um walk through what what you you guys have done yeah no i i i love what, what you just said brian you know when my wife and i when we first got married we made the decision she was working i was working yeah we don't really need life insurance now Life insurance agents will tell you, and this is not this is not like this is not like a backhanded comment because I love life insurance agents. I used to like kind of live in live in that industry. You actually sold life insurance. Yeah, I used to sell life insurance. They say, hey, you ought to go ahead and get life insurance while you're young and you can guarantee insurability. And and while there is truth in that, but in reality, if you're gonna play the probability game, you're gonna be just as insurable at age twenty-eight as you are at age twenty-two. I mean, there are certainly things that could happen, and I don't want to discount those. But those are the exceptions, they're not the rule. And so if you're someone who's young in your 20s, you're probably not, assuming no like crazy health stuff happens, you're not gonna run into this area where you're likely to be uninsurable. So like when me and my wife first got married, we didn't have life insurance. When I bought my first policy was when we actually moved out of state. And I said, all right, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna pull my wife away from her family, her social structure, all this stuff, we're gonna move from Georgia to Tennessee, And we're going to commit to like buying a home and we're going to do that stuff together. I want to make sure that if something happens to me, she's covered to where financially she can decide I either want to keep the house or go back to Georgia or whatever. So that was like decision number one for us. Well, then we had a baby and I was like, holy cow, now I got college. I've got, oh oh, man. And, and, you know, we, we, uh, you know, I, at the time I was a higher income earner, but my wife was still working and she was not as high of an income earner. So I was like, man, if something happens to me, my baby girl, she needs to be taken care of. So I got some more life insurance. Well, then we had the second kid. Well, when we had the second kid, we're like, all right, well, for our family, it makes sense for my wife to step away from the workforce. So she's going to stay home. And then it was like, oh, okay, now there's a lot of human beings depending on me. So then I got some more life insurance. Well, then life continued to move along and everything was good and i had plenty of insurance and we've been saving and the portfolio's building and we have all the business and all the assets but then we had this other kid and i'm like holy cow that's he's not he's not gonna be out of the house for 20 more years man all those policies i bought 10 12 15 years ago maybe they're kind of coming up on their term maybe i need to think about just resetting my term because some of my kids are halfway out of the house but some of my kids are just starting out so I made the decision, hey, I'm still relatively young. I'm still pretty healthy. Why don't I think about going ahead and getting more life insurance to get the insurable need, but I can also at this stage go ahead and reset the term. The point that I'm making for you, Tyler, is all along this, it's not like a decision you make one time, point in time, and you never revisit it. It's a decision that you make, and then you constantly kind of revisit as you have different life events happen. The fact that your 20s with no dependents, you're both saving, you're both working, you're both earning, Maybe it's not absolutely necessary that you have life insurance in place. As your life circumstances change, then you try to get life insurance that makes sense for that stage of life, and then you make sure that you continue to grow as your lifestyle or as your circumstances grow as well. Not to prolong the question too long, but I think that the, the reason we like term is because the goal is, look, when you're young and starting a family and stuff, you might not have a lot of assets, but you have income and other things, and you need to replace that if something happens to you, unfortunately, prematurely, mm-hmm. when you get older, like, you know, getting my age and beyond and beyond they, I'm quickly approaching where I don't really need life insurance mm-hmm. anymore. Cause I can self-insure if something happens to me, my wife is going to be completely fine just with our financial assets that we've built up over the last three, three decades. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the goal is that the, the need for the assets or to the, for assets or income to be recovered because you died prematurely will go away in the long term it, it, because hopefully in the background, that's why you also, we like term is because its cost is so low. You're just buying the cost of the insurance to replace, and it leaves a lot of margin for you to be building assets in the background. A lot of times when I see permanent insurance pitched out there, it's a, it's eating all of the pie, meaning that it's not only the cost of the insurance, it's also all of your potential lifestyle as well as investment purchases that you could be making to self-insure in the future. 
if you're paying a $10,000 a year annual premium on your life insurance versus $600, Very different. Then, then you can see how there's a lot of life in that, that $9,400 difference between those two numbers. Um, so so that that's, goes into it. Um, we're pro-insurance, but check it. There's nothing wrong with making this decision piecemeal, kind of building that quilt to life insurance. But I, I would just challenge you every time, because you, when you make that decision, like when you buy the 20 year term when you have your first child that's not to say if you've had the third child that you might say you know what premium rates have actually gone down i'm in healthier shape than i was when i got the first policy why don't we see if we can consolidate and get you know more insurance reset the term Mm -hmm. and um and by the way don't cancel old insurance until the new insurance is actually in place that's another tip that i'll I'll just share with you but great question tyler awesome tyler thanks for being here i hope that helps uh you think through life insurance next up is a question from daniel it says i had a great match and structure but very i have a great match and structure but very limited investment options are you you talking about four it sounds like you're saying a match instructor so Sorry, is that like match, a dating okay. match and structure? Yeah. We like can start match over. and structure. I, I was like, is this a dating a service? My first okay. I have a great match instructor. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, match and structure. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I believe he's talking about his four hundred one k. Okay. Um, so it says I have a great match and structure for my four hundred one k, but very limited investment options. Mm-hmm. As a twenty eight year old, should I go low cost S and P five hundred index fund? or high fee target date fund? Uh, let me give you the disclaimer, Daniel, because that's uh, we're, we have a culture of compliance here. We cannot give you any specific investment advice. So without knowing your personal circumstances or situation, we can't tell you which investment option would be best for you. However, we can talk about instances in which we've seen really good matching, really good structure, not the greatest investment options, or maybe not options that make the most sense. How do you navigate that, Brian? Like, what do you think about when the options are, maybe they're few options or maybe they're not great options. How do you, how do you look at the whole pile and say, okay, well, that's the, that's the least stinky pile. And Daniel's it. already doing some of those early steps on that. I love, maybe it's my CPA background, but whenever I can pull out a T, T chart where I'm going to put the pros on the left and the, the, the cons on the, on the right, it's an exciting thing. And you've already started doing that, Daniel, because you've already got in the pro column that, hey, this thing's got a good match. It's got a strong structure. That's good. But you, over on the con, you got limited investment choices. And, and that, what you're quickly going to realize, by the way, if you're putting weight to these de- de- decision things, the match, if there's a good match, well, I even built it into my plan of yep. the financial order of operations, moneyguy.com slash resources. Step number two, if there's a great match from your employer where they're offering you 50, 50% guaranteed rate of return on a 50 cents for every dollar that you put in, or maybe it's as good as a dollar for dollar or 100% guaranteed rate of return, that one, you, next to match, you put a check mark, you put another check mark, you put another check mark, because that one is worth like a lot. And that, that put, that's going to push the, you put its thumb on the scale heavily. Um, but then when you get down to the, to, to the what do you actually do with this money? It's not uncommon because you said you have an index fund that's really good. He said, should I do low-cost S&P yeah. or he said high-cost target retirement fund? Yeah, but but I'm just giving an experience here. It's not uncommon that we get a client who comes in and we look at their 401k and we go, man, this must have been a golf buddy who set this up because this, this 401k has a great match. But, man, these, these investment choices are horrible. And we'll sometimes say, well, what what is good in there? Let's triage and try to figure out what actually we love in here. And you're like, oh, well, they have, you know, they have a, a good bond fund mm-hmm. in here. We'll use that bond fund because we need fixed income. This person's in their 50s. But for you, Daniel, you know, if, if you're young and, and you've triaged it and you look at it and you go, hey, well, at least they have a low-cost index mm-hmm. fund. Now, you know we like, and this shows me you listen to our content, we do like target retirement funds, but we like index target retirement funds because index target retirement funds do all the great things that index funds do. They're low cost. They're very tax efficient. Not that you have to worry about that in a 401k as much, but it's just it, it, it's, it's a good thing all around. But when you have a loaded up target retirement, which maybe its fees are higher than 70 basis points i was gonna say it all depends on it's sort of relativity right because he may be looking at his index fund a bit oh that's 0.01 
Well, then there's this target retirement fund. It's 0.4. Yeah, that seems a lot higher than 0.1, but that wouldn't be like a crazy expense ratio for a target retirement fund. So it's, you know what I mean? If it's like a 1% or a 0.7%, per, that would be expensive. So some of it's got to be a relative yeah, assessment. It, it, you've got to uh, assess it. And then, look, if there is a huge difference between these like say the target retirement's greater than one percent and then the index fund is practically free then obviously you you've got to love the one you're with and maximize the opportunity but just make sure and this is something don't compartmentalize every section of your financial life you need to look at all of your financial assets together because that's where you can maybe figure out if there's a tax location game that you can be playing with this in addition to the asset allocation that you're putting into your 401k. I just love target retirement funds uh, because... Index target retirement funds. Yep, I love target retirement solutions because it removes the opportunity for me to screw up the behavior, right? Like uh, the thing that at 28, what I really want to focus on is my savings rate. What am I saving? 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 In 2022, if you own the S&P 500 fund, Maybe you're totally locked in. You're like, hey, I'm not going to sell. I'm not going to freak out. I'm not going to go try to jump around. And that's going to be great. But if you can reframe and think, hey, I got this target retirement fund, and that's just going to like, I know it's going to do what it's supposed to do, and it's going to shoot for this target. I can focus on my savings rate until it makes sense for me to focus on the bigger allocation. That's the reason why we often talk about those over indices. But I will say, there's something that shocked me. We've done content on this. I would encourage, and this is something Daniel ought to do too, is go out and look at the biggest provider of index target retirement funds. Like I'm talking about Fidelity, mm -hmm. Vanguard, Charles Schwab. Go look at the asset allocation of their different offerings. The ones that are 30 years out, the ones that are 15 years out, the ones that are right now for retirees. There is a broad difference between right. those providers. So you need to do the same thing, Daniel. Go pull those three big providers, but then also lay it right next to what yours are. And I've been shocked. And then make sure that that matches what your goals mm -hmm. are because there has been quite a bit of spread between like how much bonds yep. some of these target retirement funds have versus equities. You need to make sure do your don't you don't get to skip due diligence. Just like you don't skip leg day, you don't skip due diligence to make sure the asset allocation reflects what you actually think is important. Love it. Great. All right, Daniel, thanks for the question. Appreciate you being here. The next question is from L and M Hello. It says, me and my husband work for a ministry that does not offer any retirement benefits. No 401k, no match. We are in our 30s and we don't have anything in retirement yet. Should we change jobs? And can I be honest, that last part of the question, like, it, it got me. Because these are people who are trying to do something good. Um, and I, But I think that there are plenty of people who find themselves in a situation where they don't have that 401k or that match. So what are the options? What should they do? Well, let's be very clear. You can save for retirement without having access to retirement plans, right? Like, like it's not, let's not assume that if I don't have 401k, that means I cannot save for the future. That's a false argument because there are certainly things that you can save. Uh, all the time, we talk about like tax strategy around here. We kind of like it's above, right? We have this saying uh, at the firm, we said we never let the tax tail wag the investment dog. We don't let the small cherry on top influence what the main dessert is going to be. Well, when it comes to your vocation, if you're in ministry and it's a job that you love and you're doing meaningful work and you're paid well and all these things, I certainly wouldn't consider changing jobs just because there's not a 401k or there's not a 403b or there's not an option there. If anything, I might try to influence the nonprofit. Hey, could we have a 403b? Even if you don't put money into it, can we establish a 403b where I can defer some of my salary, no match, and I just have the benefit? Because you can do that really, really inexpensively. There's a lot of nonprofits that will make that available, even though the funding won't fund the match. You still make it part of that. But even outside of that, I don't think I would ever change jobs solely and exclusively because of a single retirement benefit. I think it has to be more of a big picture idea, big picture thing. Because in the worst case scenario, you're in your 30s, you're working for this ministry, you have income coming in. Maybe traditional IRAs are a solution for you. I mean, if you're W-2, you can't do SEPs, you can't do that. But maybe you could do a deductible traditional IRA or, or a Roth. maybe you could do direct Roth IRAs. And then once you've exhausted those, maybe if you're in a high deductible plan, you can do an HSA. And then once you've done that, maybe then you can look at an after-tax account. So you can still save for retirement and save for the future, even without having that retirement benefit in place. 
But the decision to change jobs, there should be a lot of other things that go into that decision. Um, I've, I've had the, we've worked with people who, missionaries, pastors, we, we've had a benefit of, of I, I've even worked with like hospices where they'll, they'll have a pastor on staff. Um, and, and things like that. So it, it, sometimes it might just be an education element um, for you, L and M, and the fact that you know your employer, just like Bo said, you go advocate for a four or three B. If you feel like that that's just a bridge too far for them, that you know, go look at what you can do for yourself between Roth IRAs or traditional IRAs and that type of stuff. But then also make sure you then bring in resources because if there are tax benefits for people who are going into the you know working with a church um there there's parsonage allowances yep. there's other creative things that are just part of the tax code for people who have made the decision to work for non-taxable entities and so forth so it, it just you, you're going to, have to do some research and then figure out and 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 think about the fact of okay what do i think my employer i want to advocate for and um, or, or the organization that you're you're partnering with, what can I advocate for to to maximize this opportunity that does the work that I feel led to do, but also kind of creates an opportunity so that when you if you if you do transition out of this, that you've created some type of future. Because I know uh, I have friends that have gone into the mission field, and I know pastors, and it is important that you know because th that stuff it, it, it's it's hard work, mm -hmm. and it's just good that you are thinking about the future so that you have a, a, a landing when you when you you're still in that, but you but you might serve in a different way in the future, and you just want to make sure that you're you're building up some assets outside of that. Love it, L and M. Hello, thanks for the question. I hope that that helps as you think through that. All right. Robert's question is up next. It says, how do Brian and Bo feel about home renovations? Mm. Are there home renovation guidelines for financial mutants? Okay. I'll let you, uh, I'll, I'll start. Two things, because it popped into a question we had earlier today. There is, you need to go educate yourself on return on investment, you know, so that you know kind of what you're getting yourself into with any home renovation. Because some things, I mean, the, the common sense things like kitchens usually do well, mm -hmm. master bathrooms do really well, and that you'll get a good return on investment. In the past, I always used to pick on swimming pools. You're pretty much 50 cents on the dollars just washing away just from the fact that, that you're doing it. But post-COVID, I don't know that... Um, it's still the same metric that it was, you know, before what was going on with swimming some of pools. That's community but stuff. it leads to my second point. That's the math homework. The second part is what is the benefit you, the non-financial benefit you and your family will get out of something. One of the things that I, that breaks my heart that I see people do, I was like, is that the right way to do things? Right before somebody sells their house, they will go and they'll renovate the, you know, they'll, they'll make do the, the back patio. They'll do the patio. And... They'll do the, the the master bathroom. They'll do the kitchen, um, and then they they sell the house and move out. And I'm like, if they'd have done that while they lived there, they might have gotten some benefit out of that. Mm -hmm. They got the, the the instead of having to do all this other stuff. So take into account what has the return on investment, but then also what are the non financial benefits you'll get out of this project? Because if you have a happy spouse and your kids and all these other things, there's Prices. a lot of benefits to, you know, to, to you doing some of these things. If they really are the solution to some of the things you're, you're experiencing with, with your day-to-day -day life. And you, and you have to figure out like, uh, so you asked specifically, how do we feel about home renovations? My thought is for some people, they make sense for some people they don't make sense. And, and because of all of the things that Brian just said, some people say, hey, you know, I don't want to spend any money in this house. I want to go travel. I want to go see the world. Or I want to do that. I want... That's awesome. Some people say, hey, you know what? I don't need to go on these elaborate vacations. I'm trying to make home like a vacation. I'm trying to make it the thing that I want to be, and so I can spend every day in it. I think what you have to also do is while you're factoring all that stuff in, you have to be true to yourself about how wise of a financial decision this is. For example, you said pool. You want to put a pool in the backyard, your kids might love it, and it might create so many memories, and it might be amazing. But if you've not been saving, and you've not been building towards retirement, and you've not been establishing a solid foundation, and you make the decision, rather than doing that, I'm going to do the pool, oh, like, I, I, again, I don't want you to sacrifice family memories, but I don't want you to also sacrifice your future well-being for enjoyment today. That's the opposite of deferred gratification. 
But if you've done all the stuff and you recognize, okay, I've done the things I'm supposed to do, I've done the things I'm supposed to be doing, I've been saving money, I'm adding, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the right things, I'm going to make a consumption choice to improve the house so that it's more utilitarian for our family. I love that. I think that's great. I think that's something that you should do so long as you do the research to make sure you're not adding dumb stuff that's just throwing money in the trash can. You just said something there that, that triggered him. I, if you're doing abundance goals, mm-hmm. like I, I'll tell you, experience share, We I knew... I heard of a, a, an employee that left a job, and then when they went to the new job, they took a f- rollover. They, they basically distributed out their 401k oh, to put a swimming pool oh. in the backyard. Oh. And I always like, ooh, gosh, I, I mean, it just made me cringe just thinking about it. Be honest with yourself. That's, that's what I wrote my uh, note here is because you kind of need to know where you are in the financial order of operations because if you're pulling the Clark Griswold and and, and taking money that you don't have to put a swimming pool in the backyard and then when you get the, the jelly of the month instead, you know, you're know you going you're setting yourself up yep. for a bad situation. So that's why if you know where you are in the financial order of operations, a swimming pool is probably a step eight, prepaid future expenses or abundance goals as we like to say. Because that way you've already built your financial foundation underneath you, and this is a decision to optimize mm-hmm. your personal as well as financial life. Whereas if you're going and taking a rollover or you left a job and you have a, a, a 401k that's orphaned out there, that's not the money that should put a swimming pool mm-hmm. in your backyard or even update your kitchen because you, you're stealing from your future self, and that's just not healthy. So make sure you're triaging and know exactly where you are in the financial order of operations so that you can make that decision because that is completely different if you're not on stable financial ground versus somebody who says, you know what, I've been very diligent, I've been disciplined. Now I think I'd like to enjoy my life more because here's something we've noticed. Housing prices have gotten so bad here in, oh, in where man, we that's live. where I was going. No, I'll let you, you I'll let you share. It. No, no, idea. I'm not saying because I'll let you put fill in the gaps is that it has gotten so expensive that people have realized maybe instead of going and taking on more mortgage debt, I could just do a home renovation exactly project right. and make this house brilliant. Because I know exactly that's what it. you guys are looking at. And this goes both ways in different markets. In this market right now, with where we've seen housing prices go, a lot of folks have said, hey, man, this house isn't perfect. Maybe it's too small or we don't have outdoor living or whatever the thing is. Maybe we should go find a new home. Well, you start looking around and new homes are 40%, 50% more than what you paid for your current home. You might say, man... I could probably just add an outdoor living space for a lot less than going out and buying a new home. That's true today. We've also seen it the other way. Someone said, oh man, I want to do the swimming pool and I want to add the outdoor living and it's going to cost X amount of dollars. Well, have you looked to see what homes are for sale that already have those things that have already been built in? Perhaps rather than doing the renovation, it makes more sense to go look at homes. So you have to measure both of those to make sure you're making a wise decision based on the community in which you live and the market in which you are buying or renovating into measure twice cut once don't skip the homework good answer thanks for your question robert we appreciate you being here you know a lot of you um appreciated that earlier in this episode we kind of gave a little conversation about robin hood and that match and that stuff that's going on i just wanted to plug if you're not on our email newsletter we're going to do a little more content around that plus lots of other um just money news or highlights of stuff that's going on with the show. So if you're not on that list, go to moneyguy.com and just click on that little follow us button. You'll see a place where you can sign up for our email newsletter if you're interested. We've done a lot of work on just really revamping that and making that as valuable as possible for you and really just being an extension of this Q&A and this dialogue with you. We always want to be available and just have lots of great financial content to keep you motivated, um, to help you learn and just keep propelling you on your financial journey. So head to moneyguy.com and be sure to do that. No, the newsletter's banging. I mean, it, to, bang, to the point. No, it really is. Because this weekend, y'all know. I, a t-shirt. I, I, the newsletter's banging. I, I wrote you guys <laughs> this weekend. I was traveling over the weekend. But I looked at my, my email and I was like, I don't I don't see the newsletter. Oh, yeah. You and text, and so, you I, texted so I texted all the us, entire... All of us, you <laughs> texted. I was like, did you, the I was like, I was like, did it go out? And I, so I don't know. I haven't even gotten the the... the the after action to, to know what happened to my email account. But, um, but yes, it, y'all, it, one of you were nice enough to forward it to me. 
And there was a great write up from Megan yeah, about Megan the things that. she's learned, you know, since in the nine months since she's transitioned onto the content team. Yep. And I was like, man, I, if I didn't read this, if I didn't have this newsletter, I wouldn't have gotten this piece. Um, and there was also a shout out, you know, Daniel had bought a house mm-hmm. and there was a, you know, on his FYI. Um, call, so there was all kind of good stuff. And then we also usually, People say, why don't you put chapters and things? You know where you know where it is? On the newsletter. There we go. And we will give you the Q&A with all the timestamps and everything else. I would love for you guys to give it a go. It's not just something where we've gone and harvested your email address. This is something you're actually going to get some value out of it. I actually look forward to it. And I know what's going on here. That's what's weird. You guys are doing such a good job that even though I am you know, involved with all the content meetings and everything else, I'm even finding myself looking forward to the to the newsletter. You know what else is great? If we ever have big announcements, like things that we want to let you guys know about that may be coming down the pipe, the newsletter is one of the places we might tell you about that or stuff. Or just so, just listen to Brian in the Q&A just, episode. You, know, you just hang out close enough to Brian. But if you want more details than Brian lets slip, you might want to be on the email newsletter. There we That's go. true. There it is. There <laughs> it is. There it is. There it is. All right, guys. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen. Abundance is more about mindset than it is about the money. Money Guy team, out.